same point. Oh, sorry. go Etc., etc., and the people who are interested in doing things in Asia, specifically some ministries that want to do works here, and I can help kind of counsel and guide them to find the right venues, avenues, ministry potential. And of course, the mention of Bali, everybody wants a part. You know, like Bali, oh yeah, we feel the mission's call, we want to go to Bali. So, we may have some visitors from the U.S. go there too, and we can arrange projects for them, we can do feedings, we can do outreaches, and uh, it'll be fun, as well as them coming here, but it was good. But anyway, I'm back in Asia, so happy, so happy. When the plane lands in Singapore, I feel like I want to get on the ground and just kiss it. Mwah. So good to be back. And that's, it's hard to describe because it's something God has put in me. It's an anointing. And I know my place, and it's here. So, amen. And good to see all of you. Thank you for those who labored so hard in my absence to do the meetings. And uh, I saw the messages online. I got to watch them. They were very interesting and informative and anointed. And anyway, thank you. May the Lord bless you. For Why don't we rise to our feet as we seek the Lord, as we come into his presence. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for this moment, this opportunity to meet together as the body of Christ. Uh, some of us are ears, some of us are noses, some of us are hands, some of us are feet, but we are one body in unity. And Lord, we thank you that you give us that bond of peace, the unity that the body of Christ enjoys. Lord, let our relationships grow as I share later on relationships. Lord, help us to learn about how to cause our relationships to be the best that they can be, to fulfill the scripture, to fulfill Jesus' original mandate that we love our neighbor as ourself. Jesus always, you had that plan, that strategy. The church is supposed to be a knit, close unit, even closer than biological families. And I know for me it's true, Lord. I love the people of the church, honestly, more than I love my own extended family. Because we are brothers and sisters, not just here on earth, but we have an eternal connection. And we're going to meet with you. We're going to be with you as a collection of the jewels, like you say in Malachi. We will be your special treasure, your jewels. You write that book of memorial for us. And you see, as we talk to one another, as we relate in the church, where two or more are you are here with us, Lord. So we thank you for your presence here today. Bless this time. In Jesus' name, if you agree with me, say amen. amen. Day by day. Day by day. 
make me strong. Step by step, I belong with you.
Open up my eyes. 
exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. The dream above all names, be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. The name above all names. It's 
not like you. Your presence is here, and now it seems clear that you love me dearly. When your presence is here, it seems so clear that you love me dearly. Ask in your presence, oh, I taste and see that you are good, oh, here I am renewed before your throne, before your throne, this is a place of grace, a place of mercy. Yeah. 
The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. God, we 
welcome you in this place. For truly you are here. I sense you. More real to me is your presence than the air that flows through this room, than, than the sounds, the smells, the, the ideas, everything. Lord, the reality of you far exceeds everything in this life. I pray, God, that you would bring us to a place that our awareness of you expands, it grows, consumes us, rules us. But our consciousness of you, the conscious feeling that you are watching, you're walking, that we are never alone, that each day you come and are walking with us, Lord, help us to see ourselves like Adam in the garden, walking in the cool of the day, hand in hand with God. Help us to understand the intimacy and the closeness that you have intended for us to enjoy. Lead us, Lord, to find it, to find that fulfillment of your presence. The nations are looking for you. The souls of this earth are looking for you. And the only way they're going to find you is to find those that know you. The more we know you, the closer we grow to you, the more we will show, demonstrate, and prove your reality. And in and through us will flow the manifestation of your power, the evidence of you, your anointing. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you would anoint us, empower us, use us for your glory. Let the tangible touch of God be upon us. Let the reality of you grow to such extremes that we are overwhelmed at all moments. And then as we are, let that reality transition through us to those that have hungry hearts, those that are looking. As we let that peace out of us, Lord, we know that we'll find people worthy of it. Those that are longing, those that are waiting. On this planet, we have men of peace, women of peace, people who are waiting. They did not yet know you. They have not had opportunity to meet you, but they are seeking in their heart of hearts. Some of them are of many different faiths, many different perspectives, many different ideas, but they're all longing and looking for you because you have put eternity in their hearts. And Lord, we want to connect with those as we let this treasure that you've given us. We have this treasure in these earthen vessels that we are, but we allow it to pour out of us as we release our peace, as we let our peace out. Lord, let it find the ones that will respond to it. Lead us to the soul's that need you, the souls that are ready, the souls that are hungry. Lead us and guide us, Lord. Here on this planet, Lord, as we interrelate with the people, help us in our relationships. We ask that you would help us to be better at our relationships, that we would be obedient to everything your word says. We would follow your scriptures. As we go into your study tonight of the word, the message you've given me, Lord, I ask that you would give us open hearts, that you would anoint me to share these words as they have been given by the Spirit. I apologize for my inability to share it on the level that you share by Spirit. So Lord, surpass me, go beyond me, go without me into the hearts of the hearers and give them the revelation that you've given me because I know I will fail in my attempt to convey it to them, but you can give it to them. You can cause their minds to receive it. You can cause their hearts to to understand it and for it to make a difference in them. We know it is the truth of your word, so we follow, we look for it, and we ask for your blessings on the reading of your word tonight. We ask, Lord, that you would bless everyone that hears and bless me as I speak so that everything would be done under your authority and your power. We are the ones gathered in your name. So we invite you here, Lord. Speak to us. Speak to our hearts. Speak to our minds. Share with us, Lord, the reality of, of your kingdom and help us. Help us, Lord. You are wonderful. King of kings. Lord of lords. If, if anyone is here, you have something, an unction on you to share something, please go ahead and, and share if you feel the Lord is speaking something to you for the church. We're going to put the title of our message up, Relationships, Practical Advice from Paul. In the introduction, I read John chapter 13, verse 34. A new command I give you, love one another. 
As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. If you love one another, everyone will know that we are his disciples. And as Jesus loved and proved to us the kind of love that we need to walk in, he bequeathed to us the ability to love that way, but it's a spiritual love, it's a supernatural love, we will never conjure it out of our flesh. The way we care for one another, love one another, is an indication of God's love in and through us. And of course, Jesus taught this constantly, that whatever we do to the least of others, he said, it's equivalent with having done it to him. Matthew 25, 37 says, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Jesus taught these principles from the very beginning. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. The kingdom is built on that simple principle. Those two things surmise entirely the law. He said the whole law is contained in that. Love God, yes, but love people. So much is depending upon our ability to relate to one another in a proper way, a proper manner as prescribed and detailed in the word of God. And of course, life would be very simple if we were just living for ourselves. Often I come across people in this world, but they do not know Jesus. Some of them do not really know Jesus, even though they claim some type of uh, nomenclature, Christian or whatever. They say, we believe, but, but you can tell that they do not relate in a way I cannot see. And scripture says that they will know because of their love for one another, but I often see believers that do not have love for one another. So how can anyone tell? But often people in the world, they, they are living for themselves. They themselves and everything within themselves is their only goal and their life's mission is to make their personal life better, their entire focus. And you know what? It would be far less complicated if we only pleased ourselves. Wouldn't it be easier if you didn't have to worry about people? People around you, my ministry friends, we always make the joke, ministry would be great if it weren't for the people. Of course, the ministry would just be chairs in a building. It would just be a facility, but people, so important. And if we didn't have people to deal with, if we didn't have relationships to worry about, well, we wouldn't have any issues or problems or frustrations or fights or quarrels unless you're fighting and quarreling with yourself, which sometimes we do, but we know we do have to relate to people, of course, and we know that it is impossible for us to please God if we are not doing so, if we do not relate properly. Eternity depends upon it. So it must be our constant vision and passion to make every relationship right, to make every connection we have right. The church is built on the foundation of believing in Christ. In chapter 16 of Matthew, Peter, flesh and blood, did not reveal this to you. The Father did. You're the Christ. That's love God. But in chapter 18 of Matthew, it says in the church, if you have problems with one another, go to that individual with whom you have the problem first. See if you can sort it. If it can't be sorted, then bring someone else from the church together to form some type of mediator to be able to resolve the issues in that relationship. In other words, the church's function. Those are the only couple of places in that Jesus taught church. It's when he used the word church the first two times it was ever used in the Bible was that. Him saying, flesh and blood reveals to us we become part of the church. We love God, but then we love people. Love your neighbor as yourself and resolve those issues. That passage in Galatians chapter 6, we often quote it, but I think we misappropriate its significance. It says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. How many of you ever think about this in a financial realm or giving? If you give, you will receive. The reason is because many pastors will teach that as something right before an offering is taken up or they're looking for funding. They'll say, you know, whatever you reap will sow. But look at context. 
Whoever sows to the to um, please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at that at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. All people means everybody on planet Earth, every human being. But the family of believers is who is in this room, as well as those that are out in other churches right now, meeting all over this nation and in other countries. And this, pa this passage, as I said, often we apply it to giving something and receiving, but this is talking about giving in relationship, how we treat one another. And don't be deceived. Whatever you sow into relationships, you will reap that harvest from God and from people. So the Apostle Paul cared a great deal about his relationships with people, the way he dealt with people around him. And his emotions about that were rich. He wore it on his sleeve, so to speak. It shows up in all of his letters, his hurts, his joys, everything he went through. When his relationships soured or changed, it hurt him. He expressed that. And you can hear it in his words to the churches. And you can hear it as he's telling Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 9. And I have segmented this in, in chunks because I removed the middle part, but I'm focusing on these names. It says, do your best to come to me quickly, Timothy. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in the ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander, the metal worker, did me great, a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. Verse 18 says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Achilla and the household of Anesiphorus, Erastus, stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus greets you, and so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. Here in this one segment of passage where he's talking to Timothy, he's mentioned 17 people. We have a list of that? Do we have a list? Is there a list? No list. Okay. There's 17 people that are embedded in that passage. And each of those names means something. You can go pick them apart if you have the time and the hours to do it. But each name has a significance. And if you look at all 17, it builds together. But the point is that we look at Paul because Paul cared about relationships with people. When things were not settled, when things were not right, he had problems in relationships at times. He had good ones, he had bad ones, he had ones that were good that fell apart. We know with Paul and Barnabas, they, they had a, no small contention, the scripture says. They divided, they separated. But once again, Paul cared so much because he was building on the foundation of the church that Jesus established and Jesus taught these principles about relating to one another. Paul takes it to another level Paul takes it to a greater expression, and that's what we're focusing on tonight concerning relationships. So we turn to the words of Paul to learn how to focus on the relationships we have with one another. And in this passage we just read, he, he, he wrote very dearly about these relationships with all these people, but also in Second, I mean in Philippians, that we're going to be studying the passage in Philippians chapter 2, he gave sound words of advice about the development and maintenance of our relationships with one another. And that's our message today. I just got back, of course, from the U.S. And I know it was sudden that I suddenly disappeared. And the reason was, is very dear friends reached out to me in need. And to go on the other side of planet Earth is a small thing for me when somebody needs me. If somebody really needs me, and I was reached out to very specifically... It's one thing to say, we miss you, we look forward to seeing you, oh, we would love to spend time with you, but this was a cry. This was, uh, you must come. We, I need you. You need to come. And 
That to me, because I believe in relationships and I believe in loving people, I believe in caring, I went. And Romans 12, 18, it says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Of course, Paul talking again here about relationships with people, it depends upon us as far as it does. Sometimes it does not depend upon us because no matter how much you try, that person will not cooperate to maintain the relationship. Sometimes people are looking to end the relationship with you because they cannot resolve issues or they're not willing to resolve issues. And a lot of this has to do with pride. Pride is the greatest enemy to proper relationships. Pride, arrogance, hubris, self-service. And Paul is about to describe to us seven keys to relationships to the, that he spoke to the Philippians that we can really follow. If you want to build your ability to relate to people, if you understand the importance of it in eternity, and that's the key here, it is going to resound, it is going to produce in you how you relate to people forever, forever. And so these seven keys we're going to look at, how many of you want to make better relationships with those around? Well, let me ask another question. How many of you have had relationships go sour? Yeah, and it hurts, doesn't it? Very painful, because instinctually, we are supposed to relate properly, we're supposed to resolve issues. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes we need a mediator. Well, that's what I just did. I went as a mediator to the United States of America because I was needed, and uh, long story short, the problems that existed were greatly resolved and fixed. And my mission is accomplished successfully. It's hard to live life, it's hard, relationships are hard, but we need to keep in mind that they have an eternal echo. That everything we do and the way we relate to people will affect eternity. It's so important. You cannot just sweep relationships under rugs. We will be held accountable for the way we relate to people. And that's why it's important that we always sharpen our relationship skills the best we can. And that's what this message is all about, amen? You want to go through this message with me? Now that you've been given an introduction, if you're not interested, this is your chance to escape. There's the door. Run away quickly. You know, this is not a comfortable subject, by the way. The reason is because we all have broken relationships. But that's why I mentioned that scripture, as far as it depends upon you, Paul said. Sometimes you can't, and it's heartbreaking when people are not willing to resolve issues with you but we should need to always look for amicable resolution in our relationships. So let's get into these seven keys to relationships. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. The first one is be one in spirit. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Paul's talking about unity here. He's talking about like-minded means same mind. That's all it means. The homo beginning. Like um, when we say homosexual, it means same sex. In this, it means same mind. The same mind. Can my mind and Caleb's mind be the same? It can in spirit. If he and I are enough invested into a relationship with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit then starts to change our minds so that our minds resemble one another. We have the same mind. If you have a mind governed by the Spirit, it's life and peace, the Scripture says. If you have a mind governed by the flesh, it's death. But if we allow the Holy Spirit to govern our mind, then we will all end up with the same mind. We have No, you're not. You have the mind of Christ, Paul told the Corinthians. That our mind is remodeled, reshaped, the way we think, the way we make choices changes, and that's what Paul's talking about. If any common sharing in the Spirit, if we can find a koinonia or a community in spirit with the same mindset, that's the beginning of proper relationships. Be one in spirit. And it should be our ultimate goal in relationships. Paul said that his joy is complete, when we decide to live spiritually in relation to one another, emulating his patterns of relationship building. So this unity between one another is so important. Harmony in relationships and purpose. 
is what the enemy wants to destroy. The enemy's target is relations, relationships. If he can, he, he, it's always the same uh, scheme, it's always the same strategy, divide and conquer. Steal, kill, and destroy. And he does that in relationships. Our flesh, the corrupted component of our beings, leads us to do the opposite of what we should in relationships. Why is this? Because of the aforementioned pride. We're often so proud. We want to save face. I know that's a common term used here in Asia. Save face, save face. But where is that in the Bible? Where is it in the Bible? No, Paul said, it better that I be defrauded. It better that I be cheated and take a loss than allow division to come between me and my brothers. And that's the standpoint of Christ, the standpoint of Paul, and should be ours. So his recommendation to us is, look, from the very beginning, be one in the Spirit. Be one mind, like-minded, same love, being one in Spirit, and of one mind operating. And you know, the flesh is the enemy because we see that seven stages of division. You know the scripture about the works of the flesh. I, I took out the seven that are elemental to our flesh in the way that we relate to people, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions. This is actually an evolution of the corruption of relationships. That something comes up, usually stirred by some difference, some inability to meet on the same terms or understanding, and therefore we become hateful, hatred, then causes discord, that's the verging of, or the divergence of the unity into jealousy. If one is jealous of another, then that causes fits of rage, tantrums. I've dealt with tantrums in people in counseling all the time, and I have to say, look, stop throwing a fit. Calm down. You need to talk. Think calmly. Relate. There's a time that we can get angry with fits of rage toward another, a work that comes out of the flesh. And the wrath of man, the anger of man, will never work the righteousness of God. So selfish ambition. That's the biggest one. The flesh only wants to please itself. And then dissensions come. This is schemes and plans apart from one another. Clicks. Party, partisan ideas of us in them. This even happens in churches, it happens in ministries, it happens, of course, in the world. The world is built on it. And the whole earth is built on it. That's why there are borders. And that's why there are political borders dividing nations because they just couldn't agree. And so, fine, you don't believe what I believe, I don't believe what you believe. And in fact, if, if you don't get out of my face, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to draw a line. You come across that line, I will shoot you. And then they come across that line and they shoot them. And we just saw that terribly with Hamas and Israel. What's going on in the conflicts there because of an inability to think the same. But we're not here for the world. We're not here to remedy the problems of the world. We are here to snatch people out of the fire. This is the Titanic. Earth is the Titanic, and it's already hit the iceberg, and it's sinking. We should only be concerned with rescuing the souls that are here. But we relate to each other, one in spirit. And in these seven, we see that the works of the flesh list this divisiveness, this uh, partisan thought, us and them. That's how the enemy can use our carnal instincts to destroy our relationships. And it is his target. He works so hard. And I know it because when I do counseling with people and I talk, there's so many assumptions that have wounded the relationship. Conclusions by one about the other, their motivation, without ever verifying it. You understand, if Caleb and I have a conflict and he looks at me funny, he gives me a, a, a twisted eye look or something and looks away. He may have gas, that's all. You know, he might just, mm. but I take it as assuming he's angry at me. And then I have to go back in our history together and figure what might be the motivation of that anger. <gasps> I know what it is, and I guess, and pull something out from something that was misunderstood. Before long, I'm building a case against Caleb who has done nothing by assumption. And that's how the enemy works. He, he gets into those minds. That's why you've got to take every thought captive or Satan will be able to easily manipulate you. Sadly, many of God's people are like Satan's puppets. 
He's pulling strings and they're moving. Whatever little motivation, every dark thing that comes into their head, we need to strive to make sure we do not allow him to control us, especially in relationships. So we can remedy this issue of the flesh by following the advice of Paul as we are in this message. And that leads us to number two. Value others above yourself. If one of the works of the flesh is selfish ambition, and that causes dissensions and factions, well, the solution is what Paul is laying out here. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Do nothing motivated by selfish principles, ideals, your own desires. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. So here Paul tells us not to do anything from a motivation of selfish ambition or your own prideful view of yourself. He calls it vain conceit in this passage. Vain conceit. One of the main reasons why we have trouble in relationships is because we're only concerned with our own desires. Selfishness is destructive. Selfishness is the picture of Satan when he said, I will put my throne and I will be great and I will do this. We see that collectively we can as a group be selfish with principles or with endeavors that are apart from God's purpose, like the building of a great tower. Tower of Babel shows you synergy in sin. That let us make a tower and make it great and let us not be scattered over the face of the earth. But let's consolidate, let's come together, let's become one in purpose to make our name great and make a great nation for ourselves, for ourselves, for ourselves. And it was the exact opposite of the mandate that was previously given in Genesis for us to be fruitful and multiply, cover the face of the earth. We did the opposite because we were doing it for ourselves. As an individual, it's true. But we can disarm that process by making some hard choices. One of the reasons we have these troubles, as I said, is because we're concerned with ourselves. Another reason it, 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 we have trouble in relationships is because of our pride, our self-exaltation. So we have to make the concerted effort to stop focusing only on ourselves. Or at least, not as much on ourselves. Of course, you're going to have to take care of yourself. You're going to have to deal with your own issues. But I have found through the years in counseling that the number one reason why people are suffering is because they are so self-focused. The more you look inward, the more depressed you will become. And I'll tell you why. You are human. You are fallible. You are sinful. The more you look at yourself, the more you will focus on your problems, your issues, and you will decide that I need to become better. I need to make myself better. I need to work on me. And then it's I need some me time. Me, 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 me. And you disregard everyone else and you slide into depression. I make people angry in counseling when they come to me and they say they've been battling with depression. I ask one question I always ask, what are you doing for other people? And they all get confused, huh? You said you're depressed, right? Yes, Pastor. I'm suffering with depression. So I'm asking you a question. What are you doing to serve other people? Pastor, I just told you I'm depressed. I'm in no state to help other people. I said, well, that's why you're depressed. So just get over yourself, forget yourself, ignore yourself, go love people, give to people, even though you are depressed, and I promise you, your depression will disappear. It's a simple solution. Because God did not design us to take care of ourselves. God did not design us to love ourselves. Exactly the opposite. He designed us to love Him and love people. And that's why Jesus cleaned all that mess up with those two simple principles. Love God, love man. Love God, love man. And I know, of course, as we're looking at this, it's not an easy thing. But we have to make the effort. Considering this passage, we make the choice to approach all relationships, uh, not from the platform of self-concern, but from a platform of, what does the scripture say? In humility, he said. Do nothing out of selfish ambition and vain conceit. In other words, because of your motivations for what works for you, what's in it for me, and then my vain conceit, that saving face and wanting your nobility maintained. You don't want to be cheated or defrauded. You don't want people to speak bad of you. All these things, you get so puffed up in that. And he says, in humility, value everyone else as better, above yourself. Let's go to number three. 
have the same mindset as Christ. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. This is a heavy sentence of counsel from the Apostle Paul. In your, everybody say, in your relationships. relationships. Yeah. You know what those relationships are. You have people around, you relate to them. In those, think for a moment, who do you relate to? No, don't think of the, of the happy relationships. Don't think about your friends that you're always happy with. Think about the people that you have issues with, that you do not want to be around, that you struggle with, that make you angry. They just, they just make you angry. I remember my, my aunt in relation to her sister, my Aunt Carol and, and, and my other Aunt Pat, whenever Pat would call, uh, she just would instantly change. For some reason, they had this thing. She had so much trouble relating to her sister. She could be happy. Hello, she'd answer, hello, and it would be Pat. She's what, Pat? Like, it was instant from happy to <laughs> angry, always. Loved her, but some people, it just, they always seem to do the wrong thing. Especially in the house of God. Especially amongst believers in the Christian family. We are the body of Christ. Amen? We are the body. Many members, but the same body. We have hands. We have a nose. We have a ear. We have, we have, but you know what? Somebody has to be an anus. Somebody. If you do not have an anus, you will die. You understand? So the body for Christ requires, God puts anuses in the body with a specific purpose so that we not be destroyed and die. We need that. So you're going to find people that just make you have a movement. <laughs> Excuse my vulgarity, but I'm trying to paint a picture here. We're going to have to relate to people we do not get along with, that we do not like, that we don't want to be with. So in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset. So as we relate to these people, we need to think, what would Jesus do? Remember the little bracelets they used to make with the WWJD thing and all the kids had them on, WWJD, and, and, and the fad went away. But it's not a bad thing to do or think about. Yeah, what would Jesus do? That's all Paul is saying. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. What is the mindset of Christ Jesus? Well, the Apostle Paul is telling us in our relationships with each other, this is what we need. You want to make them right. You want to do them biblical. You want to do relationships that will span all time on earth and extend into eternity, granting you a reward for those relationships. Well, then you better think like Jesus thinks because he had this mastered. We have a perfect template, an example to follow in Jesus Christ. And, and of course, this is easier said than done by instinct. We will not emulate Christ. But by choice, we will learn how to repattern ourselves after his image, following his example of relationships, the way he related to the people around him, the way that Jesus related in, in to humanity overall, specifically his disciples, shows us exactly how we should relate to one another. The same mindset as Christ. So the next five points in this message, we're in point number three. From here we go five, six, seven, or um, I'm sorry, four, five, six, seven. The next four in this message, it is the mindset of Christ. Now Paul's putting us in the position to have the mindset of Christ, but he's going to say this is the mindset of Christ. For the rest of this message, it is a description of what that mindset is. But in this point, we need to make this choice. If we follow these pointers that Paul's about to give us, we will find that our relationships will increase in value, in strength, in our ability to be a blessing. God will see us doing this as we struggle with people, but we make sacrifices to cause there to be harmony. We, we die to self. All that's coming up. When we do all these things, God will see that. The world will see it. And know that we are his disciples because why are you messing with? Why do you go through such lengths to take care of this idiot? Why don't you just walk away from these fools? But well, we struggle and we keep them and we love them because we have the mindset of Christ. Amen? Number four, the first of that about the mindset of Christ is do not consider your strengths. Do not consider your strengths. Now he's talking about Jesus, but he's just said, this is the mindset we need. Jesus who, 
being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. So let's start with that foundation. What is the mindset of Christ? It is an all-powerful God became man. Jesus, although he was God, did not use that power to advantage himself. Not even in, that's why, what do you think Satan was after that far anyway in the wilderness? When he was out there fasting for 40 days, the first thing Satan came to do is to get Jesus to serve himself. Get Jesus to take care of himself. Turn these stones into bread. I can exalt you. He took him upon the pinnacle, showed him all, the, on the mountain, showed him all the nations and said, you will have power over all these things. All you need to do is bow to me. Jesus did not consider that. And we should not seek to surpass or one-up one another. And this is what this is about. See, we all have abilities, we have strengths. When we relate to people, we have two different perspectives. We think of those people as better or worse than us. Sadly, we do this. When we assess people, pretty soon we figure out, okay, I am better. That's our conclusions earlier. I'm better than this guy at this. I'm better at that. I'm a better this. I'm a better this. That's our flesh, by the way. The Holy Spirit is not feeding you those thoughts and words. That's your flesh manifesting. Well, I'm better than this guy. This guy's a loser. <laughs> and you feel what? Vindicated and rewarded because now you meet people who are better than you. But it doesn't feel as good because it's embarrassing. Like, this guy's great. This guy's awesome. I just met a pastor in the U.S. and I felt like a, like a stupid child. This guy was amazing. Amazing. He led Bible study in the home of Ronald Reagan, the president of the United States of America. Personal friends with the U.S. president. CEO of multiple companies. He sacrificed. This guy was incredible. I felt worthless next to this guy. And you know what our instinct is in that moment? I need to get away from this guy. He's making me feel bad. <laughs> people who do not want to grow surround themselves purposely with people who are less than them so that they always feel superior. But the key to success and growth, if you want to grow as a human, if you want to grow spiritually, you want to grow mentally, even physically, surround yourself with people far beyond you, better than you, smarter than you, wiser than you. Just yesterday, I was with a whole table again at TOK, the table of knowledge, whole table of people so much better than me in every regard. And I loved it. So that pastor in the U.S. is like, I need time with this guy. I would love to spend time. I invited him to Asia. Come on over. Come on over. He wants to come. He's looking for inroads into this part of the world for missions work, etc., etc. And he's a great, great, great guy. I don't think I'll let him preach to you because then you won't want me to preach anymore. <laughs> No, of course I would let him preach and share and teach. Gifted man of God. Gifted man of God. I love them. I meet other pa I meet pastors all the time that I think this guy's basically an imbecile. Like he, he doesn't know anything. He's rambling. I hear people preach. They have no, yeah. And I just kind of sit there, hallelujah, amen. But in my selfish thinking, I'm like, I'm better than this guy. This guy can't sing. He can't do this. He can't do I can sing. I can do this. But I need to ignore that part, right? That's not part of, don't consider your strengths. And that's where the power of meekness comes in. Meekness, prautes in the Greek. Powerful word, often misunderstood because it, it does not have, it, it is tr meekness has a connotation of weakness, doesn't it? When you think, oh, he's meek. It seems to you that means he's weak. That is not at all what the word meek means. Jesus was meek. Moses was the meekest man, God said. Why? It's called, prautes means strength under control. Ability, nobility, and strength that you do not call upon and do not use. Only because your motivation is not yourself, but everyone else. So instead, all right, I'll give you an idea of when you have walked in meekness. When you play with a small child and you're playing a game, how many of you have let the child win? Although, of course, you could win that game. I mean, of course. What, what validation, what vindication do you get from, from playing a sport with a five-year-old and you're 30, you're like, booyah, there, do something about that. Woo! And you're dancing around on the field, spiking the ball. Woo! 
And the five-year-old crying idiot would do something like that. What idiot would do? I, I, one of my favorite TV shows from years ago was um, Seinfeld. And there's this Kramer character in there. And that's what he was doing. He was going to this dojo, training in karate. And, and it was a kid's dojo. And so he was fighting them. He's like a 35-year-old. And he's fighting these little kids. And he's knocking them all down and hitting them. And ha, ki, ha, ha, fighting. And he's like moving up quickly and melts because he's surrounding himself with people who don't have the ability. No, you let the kid win. You let the kid win. I let my boys... I let them win. There's times that I didn't. There's times I've competed with my sons and beat them. Then later, I just had this emptiness in my heart. Like, why did I do that? And you see fathers do that sometimes. No, let them win. That's what protest means. Meekness. Don't consider your children. We should not seek to surpass each other, to one-up each other. Sometimes every conversation is just you waiting to say the better thing. And you're barely hearing what the person is telling you. You just, you have in mind, would you, I, well, I, know, I have a better story. I have a better story. Just waiting. You're not even listening to the guy talk anymore. He's just like, I'm not having his name. Are you done yet? Well, I. And then you start talking about what you can do and no, see, that's, that's, that is, who wants to be around someone like that? You know people that do that to you. Do you seek their company? Do you want to be around those people that always, well, oh, I just, oh. no, you're like, you, you do not seek those, you see those people come in the room and you're like, oh, God, it's, it's that guy, I got, talk to me, pretend like you're talking to me, like, you don't want to connect because that destroys relationships when we do that. It, it breaks them down. Don't do that. Don't do that. I met several people on this trip. And I, I've just learned recently, stop talking about myself. And, and they asked, oh, what do you do? That, guy, that pastor I met, he's wanting to know all about my ministry and what I do. And I, just, I summed it up in like 10 seconds. My entire testimony was 10 seconds. Real quick. Just basically 10. I told them a little bit about the projects and stuff, but... About me, nothing. And then I turn it back to him. But you, brother, what, where, where, when, how? Like, just start asking questions. Because I, I, I know I don't need to sell myself to anyone. You don't need to sell yourself. God already purchased you. You are more valuable to him than anything. And to build a relationship, you have to exalt the other people. So often our attitudes are like, like we're in a competition with everyone. The ability to keep control over the impulse of being superior, or at least self, your own mindset is that you are superior all the time. It's called um, the ability to control that is your meekness, your proudness. Amen? We need to strive for that. Each person with whom you relate should be seen as a necessary part of you. Back to the principle of the body again. Not as a competitor or adversary, but a team member and an advocate. Even if he is an anus, you need that guy. So love the anuses. <laughs> love, love all the people out there. I'm sorry, Valerie. I, this is live, by the way. It is, the whole world is watching it. Love the anuses out there. They are part of the body. Sadly, those that may fall in that category have no idea I'm talking about them. Oh, I'll do that. I will do that. No. Let's go on to the next point. Number five. Now, do not consider your strengths. We said number four. Number five, make yourself a servant. Make yourself. It says rather, in other words, he said, instead of Jesus taking his strength and his power, imagine if Jesus had no practice and if he walked around the streets of Jerusalem just zapping stuff and like disintegrating Pharisees and the Pharisee contend with him. He's a... Like, <laughs> fry and he's like powder on the ground. I am Jesus. Uh, just <laughs> What a different gospel it would be. And they're going to nail him on the cross and he just like laser beams coming from the Father just frying the Romans. <laughs> and Jesus is just glowing and glowing. <laughs> like some kind of Marvel movie, the superhero. No, Jesus was meek it says. He came as a lamb silent to the slaughter. Laid it all down. And that's what Paul said. Be like that. Make yourself. Rather, he says, he made himself nothing. 
Now that's interesting. He made himself nothing. The Father did not humble Jesus. The Father did not make Jesus anything. Jesus chose of himself, and that's what it says here. He made himself nothing. How did he do this? By taking the very nature of of a servant. Was he a servant? No, he was God. He created the universe. But he made himself nothing. If you want to relate well to other people, you're going to have to make yourself nothing. Take the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. So he made himself nothing. He was not, as I said, God did not, the Father did not make this. He made this choice as a way to relate, to form relationships with us here on earth. So we're called upon by God in our relationships to make this choice. You and I must choose daily to resist the temptation to be seen and recognized for our nobility or our ability and make ourselves something we are not. Hide it. You're good at something, you're great at something, you're wonderful. Hide it until God says, I need that. Just carry it inside. I have many gifts in me. I, I have abilities you don't even know about. I have things you never know that I am a master at. And I, those things lie dormant in the background. I might need them. And sure enough, there are moments that God, when they are needed, God brings them up. Other people place a demand on those abilities. They pull them out and I serve people with it. Whatever strength you have. If you are smart, you are a servant to all those that maybe are not as smart as you. It's not your business to tell them they're not. Just use your intellect. You test your IQ. You have a high IQ and, and, and that's great, but why? So that you can say, I have a high IQ? What value is that outside of pride and vain conceit again? No, you have IQ. That means logistically you can work things out on the behalf of everyone to help them. Those people become leaders, but real leaders in the body of Christ are the servants. The greatest is the least. All those skills, all those abilities, the skill set that the Apostle Paul carried, and he laid all this down. These are not just words that he's parroting from somewhere else. These words he's teaching us as he's speaking to the Philippians are his principles of living, his principles of life. He made himself a servant. He had nobility. He had strength. He was born in Tarsus. He was wealthy. He was a Pharisee. He was perfect in the law. He gives that one passage where he goes on and talks about all his qualities and then he says he counts them all as fecal matter, it says in the Greek. Dung. He says, it's all dung to me. It's all loss. I count it all. Nothing matters. It doesn't mean he abandoned his abilities. It means he chose to put people first. Those abilities certainly served him. His education served him. His, his connection served him. When it was time, his Roman citizenship saved his life, stopped it, enabled his mission to continue. That's practice. He, he made himself a servant. So he knows he saw that in Christ and tells us to do the same. Becoming a true servant to others will never be an instinct, by the way. It's always something that has to be, you're going to have to make yourself do it. It's always a choice contrary to your instincts. Your instincts are the flesh. Don't listen, don't be true to your heart. Your heart is a liar. Your heart is going to twist you and bring you in the wrong direction. Listen to your spirit. Don't listen to your instincts. So we make ourselves do this. Jesus demonstrated it for us to follow the way we walk in our relationships with others. And this means he self-emptied himself. The Greek word means that. It, it paints the picture of if you had a jar. My Bible school teacher taught us that. A jar with a lid. Like, a, say, a mayonnaise jar or a pickle jar. And it is full of all the values of you. All your abilities and your strengths. The Greek word means Jesus unscrewed the cap of himself and he dumped out his divinity. He became 100% human, although he was God. When he came to earth, he, was not, he did not have any power. He did not do any miracles, anything, until when the Holy Spirit came upon him. After that, the miracles began because Jesus was channeling the Spirit as a template and image of what we need to do. He self-emptied himself, just like we need to follow that example and do. We make ourselves a servant. And, that, and that's what it means. And this will cause great relationships. People will enjoy being around you because they'll always feel lifted to a higher place instead of being lowered and judged and criticized. 
They always feel, they feel good around you because you are into them. You're lifting them up. You're talking about them. You're exalting them. You're loving them. You are great. You are wonderful. And, I, and there is a moment my wife and I were talking about today. Sometimes we, we tell someone they are so great, even when they're not, they believe it and sometimes become arrogant and proud. There is a place for criticism, but it has to be by the submission of the other person. Can you help me? Is there something wrong with me? Can you? And I will tell people every time when they ask me such things, look, I don't know if you're going to want the truth. I'll tell you the truth, but you might not like it. Would you rather we just not talk? How about we just love each other? I'm not going to tell you what I think. Because I found with my experience, people will beg you. No, I can take it. Tell me what you, and then you tell them, and you're like, pouty, lip out, arms folded, and mad at you. You, what does he know? And they go off angry. So it's just better just keep all that weight. If they are truly humble, if they're walking by these principles, then yeah, you'll be able to help them to grow. They can help you. And that's all part of it. Lowering is the key. If we lower ourselves, what did Jesus say? That whoever is the least, the lowest, becomes the highest. In relationships, it's true. If we lower ourselves, others will be lifted. The next point shows this. Number six, humble yourself. Philippians 2.8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Once again, this is reflexive. God's not humbling him. He humbles himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, that means Jesus chose to die. Not only did he choose it, it was his vision and his mission. Early on in his ministry with the disciples, he said the Son of Man will be handed over to men and they will crucify him. They will kill him. And of course, they didn't hear it the first time. They resisted it the second time when Peter said, I will never let that happen. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You have not the concerns of God at heart, but the concerns of man. Jesus made this choice. And this is our example. Remember what Paul said here is let this mindset be in you. Be like Jesus. Found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. We have to become obedient to things that are not going to be by instinct comfortable. These are sacrifices. Sacrifices. In our relationship with people, we lower ourselves to a place of productive exaltation of them. And of course, we're going to have many friends because who wouldn't want to be around someone that makes them feel good? Lifts them up. And this requires extreme sacrifice at times. Mental, intellectual, even physical sacrifice. Sometimes you, you just, you cannot. I often intellectually want to be combative and fight because they're speaking rubbish and I refrain. I stop, no, let them let it all out. Let's listen. If they ask for my opinion, I can get it. But how I share that opinion makes a big difference. It requires sacrifice. Number seven, this is our last point coming to the end of our message. Let God exalt you and not yourself. Philippians 2, 9, he says, therefore. Now that word therefore is very powerful. It means everything we've read up to this point has produced this end. Everything was the means. Making yourself a servant, humbling yourself. Uh, the, the earlier points of, of not considering your strengths. This is moving up to this. Therefore, if we can do this in relationships, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So now we see the results of the sacrifices. Jesus became obedient unto death, even death on a cross, it said in point number six. And as a result of that sacrifice, the Father is lifting him up. As a result, the Father will lift us up to the highest place. And, and it's, it's a trust issue, really. I believe that Jesus implicitly trusted the Father. Uh, that's, a, that's kind of infantile to say. Of course he did. But that is the template for us to follow. Can you trust the Father that if you do this process, the process of self-humiliation, the process of humbling self, taking the form of a servant, doing these things, making these choices to just put everyone else first. Can you trust that the Father is keeping tabs on all this? Because it might take years before you see the real reward for it. But it's worth it. It's so worth it. It's a trust issue. 
to make these choices. And we struggle at times in the process because we feel cheated of the honor and recognition that we crave. Whenever that feeling comes to you, that you feel that you're not being honored and people don't respect you, the first thing you should do is give glory to God for the right atmosphere in which we should live. And the world lives in the opposite direction. The world insists upon honor and dignity. That's why I don't like special parking places for pastors and raised platforms with little pasture thrones and all, you know, those churches you go to and everything's this special place, special place. No, we're all the same. In fact, the pastor shouldn't even be able to park. The pastor should come in with a mop and a bucket and clean up before and after the service, do all those things, and that is someone emulating Christ. And of course, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but I have done it, and I love doing it. But through the years, people have stolen my mop. They take my jobs away from me. But I start, I do all, I do everything. I never ask anybody to do anything, but one by one, they start coming, well, can I do that? Can I do that? Can I do that? And I say, no, it's okay, I got it. I got it. No, I want to do it. No. And they literally have to steal my mop. And once they steal it, that's it. Now they deserve the mop. And I don't have the mop again. Caleb has stolen my vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and it's a nice, we have a Dyson, we have a good vacuum cleaner. I don't think I've ever vacuumed in here. I would not be allowed to do it. If I tried, Caleb would stop me from doing it. And so, okay, Caleb can vacuum if he wants to vacuum. It's a trust issue with God. Do we trust that when we do these things, God is watching? Of course he is. If we're patient, we trust the process of the Father, we will also, like Jesus was exalted, we will be exalted to a high position. As first of all, let me, let me clarify something. It's not wrong for you to want to be exalted. You understand? That's not sin. Sin is not you wanting to be high, lifted up, and, and being honored. But when you do it for yourself, it's sin. You will be honored. If you, if you take and trust this process of humiliation, the mindset of Christ, you will be exalted to know. And I know from experience, I have, been, I have so many friends. I have so many people that love me. So many people that would die for me. I have hundreds of homes around the world where if I showed up and knocked on their door, they would cry that I chose to live in their house. I know that sounds like I'm bragging, but it's a fact. Why? Because I poured my life into those people. I loved them. I made them first. I exalted them. I gave time to them. I sacrificed for them. And I took practically nothing back. And as life moved on, I walked from relationship to relationship and did this again and again and again around the world in many countries. And as a result, I've left a trail of reward that I may never be able to cash in on, but it's there. People get concerned about me when they hear I have no money, I have no savings, I have no retirement. I basically is like, I'm like someone that has taken a vow of poverty, quote unquote, like often priests or do and all that. I'm basically, I have nothing. I have nothing. I am not scared at all because I believe this process and I've sown my whole, be not deceived. God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows in relationships, he will reap. Amen. And I think it's a gift. The scriptures are offering us this ability. This makes you invulnerable. This makes you powerful. This makes you able. You will be exalted. It's just maybe not here on earth. Maybe it'll be in eternity. That's where Jesus was exalted. And I'm okay with that. There will come a day. You will see me in heaven and wave at me. Hey, Stephen, unless... Unless you really give your life, really just believe this system and love people, love people, love people, you will see the same rewards and we can all see it together. 1 Peter 5, verse 5 says, as we come to a close, Yea, all of you be subject to one another and be clothed with humility. I like that because you're not dressed, you dress yourself. Once again, be clothed with humility. Put on the garment of humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. The due time means there is a season and a moment that God decides in this process of your choice to be a servant and humble yourself in your relationships 
God, at the right time, he will lift you up. He will exalt you. He will reward you. So we need to make a commitment to this process of becoming like Jesus in every relationship we have in life. And knowing that, so much depends. If we have this knowledge, so much depends upon it being done properly, these relationships, and how it affects eternity with Christ. Man, we need to make it a priority, a high priority, that we sort out our relationships, that we love people. Stop saying, but he, but she, but they. Those are the words of a malcontent that has not understood the word of God. You should never have to say, but you don't understand, this happened, that happened. No, be a sermon, be a sermon. Imagine if Jesus had that mentality. It says, let the mindset of Christ be in you. What if Jesus took the mindset of us and he did not, or avoided, or complained, said, but the Pharisees, they were mean to me and, and they wanted to hurt the Roman soldiers. They nailed my hands. They did the opposite. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What a beautiful example for us to follow. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good. This is the passage we saw earlier. Yeah, it's a choice. I will say this. If you do good to people, if you relate to people the way that Paul's recommending in the mindset of Christ, you will have the temptation of growing weary because people don't reward you. People are not going to give you right away the things you think you deserve. But it doesn't matter. Every person you look at, Whatever you do to the least of anyone or the greatest, you do it to Jesus. I just put a Jesus mask on everybody. Put a Jesus mask on your worst enemies. Put them on your best friends. Put it on your wife. Put it on your husband. In serving them, you are serving Jesus. Everything you do. They might not act like Jesus, but I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. Don't become weary. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, every chance you get, let us do good to all people. Just do good to them. Especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Those in the church. Amen? Relationships. Seven keys we saw here. Number one, uh, be one in spirit. That's the unity that, that we're looking for, that we have the mind of Christ. Value others above yourself. It's a choice. Have the same mindset as Christ. Take upon yourself the mentality of you have the mind of Christ, provided that you're yielding to the Spirit and not to the flesh. But the flesh is powerful. The flesh is going to work. All those words we saw, the, the works of the flesh, division, dissension, all that quarrels and striving and all that he's going to, the flesh is going to try to tear you down or tear you away from relationships and Satan's going to use your flesh. If you are flesh prone, Satan is happy. If you're spirit prone, if you're subject to spirit, Satan is, is made useless in your life. He can't do anything. He can't touch you if you live by the spirit. As you have opportunity, do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. One in spirit, value others above yourself, have the same mindset, do not consider your strengths. Let the kid win every now and then, amen? Make yourself a servant. Nobody's going to make you a servant, by the way. Nobody's going to do that for you. You're, you're going to have to make that choice for yourself like Jesus did. Humble yourself, same thing. You're going to have to make yourself low. Whoever is the least will be the greatest. Let God exalt you and not yourself. And you're going to have to trust that process. That's the bottom line. Trust the process. Amen? I, I pray for your relationships, the way that you relate to the people around you. I pray for you to have power from God to be able to deal with the ornery, resistant people, to deal with the people who are problematic and troublesome in your life. They're there to bless you. They're there to teach you. Everyone who causes trouble in your life, thank God for them. Rejoice when you fall into different kind of relational tribulations, knowing that the, the patience that's going to be built in you because you're, you're not growing weary. You're standing in relation. Love, 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 love people. And it, I can tell you horror stories of relationships I've had. My wife and I can tell you a legacy of mistreatment by many people. Abuse. Abuse. But why focus on that? 
They were all opportunities for us to grow. And those situations have exalted us and lifted us and provided for us and have caused us to be where we are today and will cause us to be where we're going in the future. And I recommend the same to everyone. Amen? Why don't you stand to your feet with me? Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We give you glory. We give you praise. Uh, this is not easy in life. It's not easy to relate to people. I truly believe that life would be so much better if I did not have to relate to people. I'm an introvert, Lord, you know that. I, I, I am not comfortable dealing with people. It has been a struggle for me my entire life to just have friendships at all. I've always been content just to sit in a corner by myself and play with my Legos and hide and just live in my own little selfish fantasies. But God, I know that there is no value in eternity. In fact, it's detrimental. It, there will be punitive measures against me if I only love myself. But you've caused me to be able, when it's necessary, to come out of my shell, to love and to invest my life into other people make sacrifices according to your scriptures. So Lord, I'm grateful. Thank you for giving us these opportunities to love the hard to love people or even the unlovable people because that's what you've done for us. Spirit of the living God, you are the one that can give us the mind of Christ. You're the one that can cause us to think like Jesus thinks, to act like Jesus acts. Therefore, from those thoughts, speaking the words of Jesus. We invite you into our lives tonight, Lord, to empower us specifically for relationships. Lead us to the resolution of issues and problems in relationships that have soured. Help us, Lord, even if we have to go back in time and find unresolved relationships and work at fixing them. Help us to have a vision to do that, a passion to just make everything right as much as is possible. I mean, it's not always upon us. It's not always going to be our choice. Through the years, Lord, I know people that have disliked me, we've disagreed, and I have worked vehemently to fix those relationships, but they refuse, refuse to even try. But I, in my heart, believe that there will be a day, there will be a time uh, before we pass from this life to the reality of life in the future, in eternity, uh, that there will be a, a reckoning, a time that we can sit. Even if it's on one another's deathbeds, Lord, I pray that I don't leave this planet without any trouble, any stress, any brokenness in relationships. But meanwhile, while I relate to the people around me, help me to follow these principles that we just studied. Help us all to do this. We love you. We thank you that your word is life, your word is truth. The more that we live it, the more successful we will be in every area, especially relationships. Lord, help us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. To do good to all, no matter what. In doing so, we will heap coals upon the heads of our enemy, turning the other cheek. All of these things that you taught, Jesus, we believe them. It's just hard to do sometimes because of our hubris and our pride and our arrogance help us Lord, break us of our pride our desire to be seen as right help us Lord. we love you jesus we know that you can cause us to be whatever you need us to be we submit to you we yield to you lord we give you everything we ask for your help lead us and guide us in our relationships lord we pray in the name of Jesus. Let's just sing one last song together. Let your glory fill this house. Let your praises fill our house. Let each vessel offer up to the sacrifice of
So here on the Saturday before the Christmas, Saturday before Christmas Eve, we'll have a regular service. We will meet here and there will be exchanging of um, gifts. Just bring a small gift, not an expensive one. Don't bring like a Sony PlayStation or something. Bring, bring like a small thing, uh, less than $10. You know, just something so that we just bring because you will be given a gift that someone else brings. And if you are under pressure and you can't do that, fine, we'll have some extra gifts. But also we have some things we'll be giving away. We'll do like we do every year, have some contests and some competitions and do some songs. And if you're interested in doing outreach with us a couple of hours before the service, we're going to take gifts to the streets out here and we're going to meet people who do not know Jesus and we're going to give them a gift and an invitation to try to get them to come in and hear the gospel. Amen? So we can be evangelists also. We're still, it's still some time away. We're just planning now. We will give you the details. If you're interested in helping with the development of that, please just talk to Valerie and she can coordinate with you what we can do together. Amen? Love you guys. See you soon.